And if you believe that he loves you more than you ever loved anything, and that he is stronger than the strongest energy in the universe, then that he knows you, that he loves you, and that he's strong combined to give you amazing peace in those situations where things have gone very badly. The fact that Jesus loves us like that is really good news. So what else does it mean that the long-awaited Messiah has come for us? That's the question John Piper answers from John 1, 35 to 51 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on November 30th, 2008. What I want to do is give you seven glimpses of the glory of the sun that I see in this passage. Number one, John shows, the writer of the gospel, that Jesus is the goal of John the Baptist's ministry. Let's just read these verses, 35 to 37. The next day, again, John was standing with his two disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. So point number one, John's ministry exists to get people to leave him and go to Jesus because Jesus is the Lamb. Number two, Jesus is followed by these two. And I think symbolic of the way we should. Jesus is followed by these two because he's a sin remover. Okay? Back in verse 29... John had said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's a sin remover. Animals can't do it. The Lamb of God can do it. Now notice the connection between verses 36 and 37. See if you don't see what I see. Verse 36, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. And verse 37, So they heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. The reason they left John is because he doesn't take away sin. He's not the lamb. This is just huge. The implications of this are huge. In other words, following Jesus is first and foremost not heroic. I'm desperate. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I'm not like David's mighty men following David. We're going to protect him. If he wants water, we'll get water. We will not let anything happen to our king. That's not the way you follow Jesus. You follow Jesus like sheep follow a shepherd. Bat, bat. I'm hungry, I'm needy, I'm lost, I'm desperate, I'm a sinner, wolves abound, save me. That's the way we follow Jesus. If that's too little for you, you're not ready yet. You're too big. We're just sheep. We're desperate for a Savior. He's the Lamb of God. Why wouldn't we go after the Savior of the world those who are well have no need of a physician. Those who are sick, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. So my second picture of the glory of my Savior is that he's the Lamb of God who takes away my sin and invites me to follow him, not as David's mighty men, serving and working for him and protecting him, but just the opposite, namely, I'll take care of you. You need me. Number three, Jesus is the giver of spiritual sight. Verses 38 and 39, let's read them. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, 
Where are you staying? That's really a bad answer. But we'll come back to that. He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him for that day, for it was about the 10th hour. That's 10 from 6, that's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So they stayed the rest of the day with him. Now, go with me. Here we begin to see what we're going to see dozens of times in this gospel, namely that Jesus intentionally uses language at multiple levels of meaning. He deals with people who are at one level of meaning while he's working at another level of meaning and he's trying to draw them down into where he is. That's what's going on again and again and again in this gospel. They're at a physical level, he's at a spiritual level and he's trying to pull them in with him. For example, Nicodemus, talking about physical birth. Jesus is talking about spiritual birth. Woman at the well, she's talking about, you don't have a bucket, this well is deep, and he's talking about the water of eternal life. Crowds ask for physical bread, and he's talking about living bread that came down from heaven, and I'm it. Pharisees deal with a man who was physically blind, and that's all they see going on. And Jesus says, for judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may... See, and those who see may become blind. Verses 40 to 41. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said, We have found the Messiah. What were you, what were you guys seeking? Where do you live? We have found the Messiah. When they came, they saw. When they saw, they found. The Messiah has been seen, he's been found, and now they're out doing what I hope you're doing. Jesus began this relationship by saying, what are you seeking? And they go and say, we have found the Messiah. So my third glimpse of the glory of the Son is that he is the giver of spiritual sight. Number four, he's the Messiah. And I'm going to pass over this one because we'll probably talk about it more when we talk about titles next time, Lord willing. Number five. Jesus has the authority to change your identity. Jesus has the authority to change your identity. Verse 42. He, that is Andrew, brought him, that is his brother Simon, brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter. In John's gospel, there's not a word of explanation about this. Like, and Peter means rock, and rock is what you build a church on, Matthew 16, 18. Not a word. That is not the point. The point is, I change your name, period. Next point. Anybody else want to talk? You are a different person. I'm in charge here. I give names. That's the point. That's, he doesn't say a word about the meaning of this. He just, boom, changed his name. Like, you can imagine. Simon, what? <laughs> you can't tell me what I'm going to be called. My dad tells me what I'll be called. and This is raw, sovereign authority without a word of explanation. And I want to apply it like this. He does that for every one of you who will come to him. Now, how do I know that? It's not just Peter who gets a new name. You get a new name. I'll read you where Jesus said that. And I'll tell you where it is. 
to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. That's Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Jesus speaking to the churches. I will give the one who conquers. How do you conquer? This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. That means the one who believes me unto the end, through thick and thin, I will give them in the last day a stone, a white stone, and it will have a new name on it, and only you and I know the name. I think the stone is already written for those who are God's, and uh, that's who you are, and you are discovering little by little who you are. I'm 62, and sometimes I don't think I have any idea who I am. That sounds strange. I feel like I've got so far to go till Christ is formed in me. Remember that image from Galatians? Paul's groaning with birth pangs till Christ be formed in you. And when Christ takes form in you, you don't lose you. You just become a new, unique you with Christ as the biggest reality. And here I am 50 plus years into the walk with him and feel like I'm just got so much being shaped to need in my life. Identity to be given to my life. I, I act so out of character to the real John Piper. Become what you are is what Christian life is. What you are in Christ. What you are on that stone. What that identity, that new identity is. So the fifth beautiful thing about Christ is that he has authority to change our identity. Number six, Jesus has authority unilaterally to command allegiance. Let's read it. Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, the first couple of disciples, you remember, heard John say, Behold the Lamb of God, and then it says, They followed him. And now we move to a new level, and Jesus is taking charge and says, To whomever he please, follow me. So Philip followed him. This is really encouraging. The powerful evidence that you're His is that you came. He brought you. You're not in a fragile situation. These hands are not fragile. Chapter 10, verse 29, nobody can pluck them out of my hand. My Father put them in. Nobody takes them out. So, number six, Jesus has authority unilaterally to command and get allegiance. Finally, number seven. Jesus knows our internal and external condition. Let's read verses 45 to 48. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Now, you recognize these words? Come and see. That's what Jesus had said before they knew what they were coming to. They didn't get it fully, and then they saw. Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no deceit. That's very strange. This guy just said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Jesus says, There's a man without any guile. 
Well, no, but he's full of prejudice. Is that? Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus knows two kinds of things about everybody. He knows what's on the outside, your circumstances, whether you're on a fig tree or not. And he knows your inside and whether you're deceitful or not. He knows two things about everybody. He knows your inside, he knows your outside. I regard this as spectacularly good news. Maybe you don't, I don't know. Maybe the knowledge of Jesus of your life is scary to you. I would like to describe it for you, bring you to a point where perhaps it would sound like glorious gospel rather than scary. First thing Jesus says um, is, you're a man without any deceit, Nathaniel. That's the truth about the inside. And then he says, while you were under the tree, when Philip found you, I saw you. And that's the knowledge about the outside. So you see where I got it. No deceit in here, under the fig tree out there. I'm just pointing those two things out. The last thing we're focusing on is these two, what feel to me incredibly precious. God knows me externally in every situation I'm in. God knows me through and through on the inside, the good and the bad. Why is that such good news? It's a great grace that Jesus today, the Son of God, the King of Israel, knows our condition outside. If you're alone sometime and you get into trouble and nobody knows it, you're all by yourself and you're in big trouble. Jesus knows it. You are never in a situation that nobody knows about, ever. Don't care how dark it is, don't care how dangerous it is, don't care if you're kidnapped, folded up in the back of a trunk for days. He knows. And if you believe that he loves you more than you ever loved anything, and that he is stronger than the strongest energy in the universe, then that he knows you, that he loves you, and that he's strong combined to give you amazing peace in those situations where things have gone very bad. You know, I, I used to not be too impressed. I don't know whether it's age or whatever. I used to not be too impressed by the fact that Jesus knows all about me as a part of my comfort. I always wondered when I talked to simple folks, especially older women, and we'd talk about their problem, and they went, they'd end the conversation with this. God knows. <laughs> I think that, well... God knows, which in their mouth was hugely comforting. They must have known something I didn't feel at the time. And now, for me to think that there is not a circumstance on the planet in which my God will not know it down to the last centimeter of the situation, then it's very precious. He loves me. He's very strong, and there's nothing about my circumstances he doesn't understand. It gets better, at least for me. Not only does he say, um, you were under the tree and I knew it. He says, behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, verse 47. And verse 47, I've thought a long time about this. What, what is the point of saying that? Especially after Nathaniel just said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The old versions say, here's a man in whom there's no guile. 
an Israelite in whom there's no guile. Guile, just an old-fashioned word for deceit. I don't, I don't think it would work to just take verse 47 all by itself and say that somehow Jesus is pronouncing on the virtue of this man. Uh, just out of the blue, choose, let's just choose deceit. Let's just say there's no deceit. Out of the blue for no reason whatsoever? I don't think so. I think this is a response to what he said. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, you know what Jesus heard when he said that? First, prejudice. Everybody that comes out of Nazareth is a jerk. Therefore, if he comes from Nazareth, he's a jerk. That's, that's called prejudice. You make up your mind about the specific by the whole, okay? And that's what he said. I know, I know Nazarenes. <laughs> there, ain't, there ain't no Messiah coming out of Nazareth. And he just, just says that. Jesus hated hypocrisy more than he hated anything, it seems. I mean, you, just, you read the story, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, Pharisees. I mean, Matthew 23 is horrible. And what did they do? They were whitewashed tombs. He was so cleaned up here and inside dead men's bones. Ooh, Jesus hated that. And Nathaniel wasn't like that. What you see is what you get. Nobody can come out of Nazareth who's good. I'm telling it like it is. I think Jesus saw that and he said, hmm, I can work with that. <laughs> Do you remember when he asked the Pharisees, baptism of John from heaven or from man? Remember what they did? You know, off in a little corner and say, if we say it's from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe on him? And if we say it's from man, then they're going to stone us because they really like him and think he's a prophet. So what are we going to do? Let's say we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Remember what Jesus said to that? I'm done. See you later. That's my paraphrase. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. I won't talk to people like that. There's a lot of people like that in the world today, you know. A lot of postmodern, slick manipulators of words. Truth doesn't matter. Just save my skin. Get me elected. Whatever. But you hear a man who says, Nobody can come out of Nazareth worth a toot. I can work with that. No guile there. No deceit there. Tell it like it is. Same thing on the outside that's on the inside. He didn't mean when he said to Nathaniel, here's, here's a, a man in whom there's no guile. He didn't mean this was a good man. He's a prejudiced man. He's a sinner man. He needs Jesus. He's commenting on the blunt, tell it like it is, Verse 46. Now, application. Not going to be what you think it is. He knows my insides. Okay? He knows what that said about what's going on in here. And he knows what's inside you right now. And what's inside me right now. There's an old Negro spiritual. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Now that's got two possible meanings. One seems wrong to me, and the other seems precious to me. One meaning is nobody's ever walked, walked where I'm walking. Nobody's ever been in the circumstances I'm in right now. I think that's just wrong. That's self-pity probably. Of course somebody's been in your circumstances and a lot worse. But there is a side to this. 
And this is, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, and that's why this text landed on me the way it did. That's why I'm closing this message with this point, because it's just powerful for me personally. I sometimes wonder, not whether anybody has had a sorrow that I have, or an anger that I have, or a desire that I have. I know they, they, they have had those, but they've never had mine. They've never had this sorrow, meaning mine. This anger, this lust, this whatever. Nobody has ever been in my skin, been me, and dealt with this. Me as me. And if you think about that long enough, you can start to feel real lonely. Catch. Sure, people have tasted this with their kids, or this with their wife, or this with the church, or this with the city, or this with their health. Sure, but nobody, nobody has ever been in my skin, bringing my personality and my sins and my weaknesses and my history to this moment of emotional sorrow. And you can feel, God, I don't even, I mean, if nobody has ever been me in this situation, how do I get my bearings? And that's where I hear Jesus say to me, I know it better than you know it. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper preaches a sermon titled, Son of God, Son of Man, from John 1, 43 to 51, in our series on the Gospel of John, God's Final Message. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.